Well, Ron, this is this is awesome for us. We, we appreciate you doing this. We'll try and keep it what under three hours. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we're going to make it short. We'll try and make it shorter. Yeah. Keep it under three hours. But you're you're a challenging guest. Why? Why, why do you why do you think that? Because you're on TV every night. You've written two books. People uh, every, know a lot yeah, about. Yeah, there's know. nothing private about me. Every, yeah. everyone knows everything. <laughs> right. We need to. I mean, we we're going to need to use some skills here to try and get something you new. Got to dig you. deep. Yeah. Or you're going to just tell us. Okay. Yeah. You just right off the bat tell us. Know. We'll go 2020 on you. I, I, think, we need to. I think I'm going to make you guys work just a little All right, bit. That's <laughs> fair. That's <laughs> fair. Um, let's start with this. Okay. Hey, did you ever win a World Series? <laughs> I did. Uh, I did. It was in the mid '80s. I forget what year it was. I think it was '85. No, '86. No. Let's start with this. You know, obviously, as an athlete. That is your sole focus growing up, right? And your you're blinders on thinking about Major League Baseball. When you look at where your life is now and mm. how much notoriety you've gotten post-career, mm. does it surprise you at all how much of a, you know, a different thing kind of has taken up in your life? Yeah, watch out what you wish for kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in my house, it was kind of uh, different uh, because uh, neither of my parents graduated from high school. So getting into college, because I was the firstborn, was the, was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky that when I was a kid, I was, I was good at sports, of course. Um, but my father, in those days, you know, didn't have travel teams or anything like that. So he pushed me to play. When I was six, I was playing with 10-year-olds. When I was 10, I was playing with 13-year-olds. When I was 13, I was playing with 18-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of learned how to play. As far as notoriety, no. I mean, you know, when I signed with the Texas Rangers and then traded to the Mets, I thought that that signing bonus was going to pay off my school loans, <laughs> that within two years they'd figure out that I don't belong at this level, and I'd be back at school. And uh, 16 years later, I was still playing. It's just, uh, I, I think some po at some point, I feel like someone's going to say, we just punked you, you know, for the last 30 years. Well, you got into college, but you didn't just get into any college. You got into <laughs> Yale. <laughs> What, I feel like there's only been a few baseball players even since you that have made it to the major leagues from Yale. Why did you go there? I feel like it wasn't to become a major league baseball player. You know, I was a football player in high school, and uh, I wanted to play both sports, football and baseball, and I, I ran track, too, at, in high school. So I wanted to be able to play multiple sports. Also, when I went to college, I was about 5'10", 155, mm -hmm. 160 pounds. So I didn't think I could play at an elite level. Mm -hmm. So I thought by going to Yale where I could play both sports, get a great education, was the way to go. And then between my freshman and sophomore year, I grew six inches. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when it changed. So everything I did, which was pretty good, mm. not great, was pretty good, just got exponentially better because I was just a bigger athlete. So what, was what, that, oh, sorry? What, what did you, when you went to Yale, yeah. what were you trying to become? What was your end goal? Was your, what was your plan as a profession after that? That was, that was a great question. Uh, uh, originally, um, I wanted to be pre-med. And then I took organic chemistry my freshman year. That pushed me out forget of that. It. Yeah, forget <laughs> that. I can't do that. Um, then I wanted to be an architect. But with playing two sports, I really couldn't go through the uh, Vin Vincent Scully was the, was the um, head of the architect school there. So I couldn't really do that. So I was going to go the route of everyone that goes to Yale. And that is I was either going to go to the law school or the business school. Yeah. And that's where I was tracked. And, and I'm so honest when I say I really thought I'd be here a couple of years. Um, in a professional uniform, they'd figure it out, and I'd be back with uh, my classmates. So when was the moment then? Was it in between that freshman and sophomore year when you grew, where you said, you know, maybe I could make the major leagues? I mean, I, you know, it's forget about sustaining yourself, yeah. but I imagine that there's a time where all of a sudden that dream becomes, uh, oh, wow, this is at least a potential reality here. It was, it was the summer of 1980, and it was the last great year I had playing baseball. I'm not saying playing professional baseball wasn't great. It was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you why. I went to the Cape Cod League and I had to kind of beg George Greer, who's now the hitting coach with the St. Louis mm -hmm. Cardinals, uh, to play. He said that he had a few University of Minnesota Gophers who were in the College World Series. I could play for maybe the first couple of weeks. When they came back, I would have to leave. Mm -hmm. And I played that summer and that league was known for having all the best players in college all over the country. And in that league, at the end of the summer, I won every major award there. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying I needed that shot of confidence that after that summer, and I didn't pitch, I played. Yeah. Um, uh, after that summer, I was like, wait a minute. These guys are all the best around the country. I'm better than they are. <laughs> and it was the first time that I felt that I belonged. You hit 336 in that <laughs> league. I looked it up. So at that point, you're, you're, you belong. You're hitting. Are you thinking that you might be a position player? 
in pro ball? I, I wanted to be a, a position player. Um, lack of talent made me into a pitcher. I mean, that's kind of how, or not being able to hit the, uh, the ball spinning. But um, my favorite story about that is I got elected into the Cape Cod Baseball Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And I went in with Nomar Garcia Parra and Jason Veritek. And when they gave all our stats, I hit higher that summer than they <laughs> did their summer. So I always think that's uh, one of the great achievements. <laughs> when, uh, when you look at your college career, I mean, it has to be, I would assume it's the highlight for you because it's one of the greatest, mm -hmm. if not the greatest games ever pitched in college, the, the Yale versus St. John's game. You had Frank Viola started for, right. for St. John's, right? I mean, you're taking a no-hitter into the 12th inning in that game. Was your arm tired? Uh, 100, <laughs> 176 pitches, by the way. 176 pitches. In mm -hmm. the moment, do you realize what you're doing? Like, is it a, a cognizant thought, or are you just thinking, all right, Go out again, got to gotta make it through this inning. Yeah, there was never a, like, dig me moment uh -huh. during the game where I was like, boy, I'm really, uh, th this is really a great thing that's happening. No, it was just, um, honest to God, before we played St. John's, the day before, it was uh, some real intense tests at Yale. So most of our team was not even on the field the day before. Mm -hmm. So St. John's comes out in their beautiful red uniforms, and they come out with it looked like 55 guys, and they're running around the field, taking infield, taking batting practice. We have like five guys on our side who can even make practice. And um, uh, I remember going to that game feeling, God, let's just not get embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Because I think their record at the time was like 55 and four or something like that. And uh, as the game went on, then it gained momentum, and then it became one of those things where, you know, how long, who, who's gonna blink first? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I did. Did anybody talk to you during that game? Was anybody, were you sitting <laughs> completely by yourself? <laughs> you know, I still, I still hit in those days. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there was, there was constant back and forth and, you know, what, what's Frank got? And, you know, we were trying to figure him out, which we couldn't. And, um, but it was, I, I knew it was special. The first time I knew it was special was as soon as the game was done, people started spilling out of the stands to take pictures. <laughs> Uh, with cameras, take pictures <laughs> and um, and to get autographs, and I remember just like, whoa, that's strange. I mean, I'm used to being pitching in front of like my parents and a couple other guys' <laughs> parents, um, but uh, uh, that was the first time. And then when I look behind the screen, it was probably it's right before the draft in '81. Uh, players were striking at the time, so there was no Major League Baseball. And there were probably a hundred scouts there. Oh. So that was the first time that I was like, whoa, this yeah. is a major deal. That's so cool. <laughs> 176 pitches, uh, if you see that now, that's malpractice. That's right, that's right. Back then, it's like, oh, those yeah. are the good old days, 176 <laughs> pitches, that's how you did it. Did, what's your thought now about how pitchers are brought up at this point in their careers? Yeah, uh, I mean, I look at the, the guys the Mets have, let's say, uh, Jacob deGrom, he would have been good um, any uh, year that baseball played, the same with Noah Syndergaard. So when I look at them, they're such physical specimens. They certainly are as strong or stronger than I've ever been in my career. So um, they certainly could have the same impact innings-wise, complete game-wise, shutout-wise, um, that any pitchers in my day or before. Um, I, I personally, now this is, this is strange because probably when I played, I might have thought differently. But I had a six to eight year window where I was really good. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's most pitchers. So my, my thought is if you can identify a Syndergaard or DeGrom, I would as a team say, listen, I'm gonna give you a good contract, four or five years, I'm gonna tie you up for a while, but I am gonna use you until I use you up. And if somehow, somewhat, you make it through this boot camp of six year, a five or six year contract, then you have another bite at the apple. But at the same time, you're getting taken care of financially. So. Um, I just think that there's this window that we're, we're trying to be so careful in preserving these pitchers that we're missing all the greatness that could provide. You, know, you talk about your window, and, and there were a number of things that stood out about your time as a major league pitcher when you were at your finest. Um, you know, certainly you had the split finger, you had an unbelievable pickoff move, uh, won a gold glove. For you, was there one thing that you think, especially in those years, really made you the success that you were? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I look back on my career, I, I think um, um, 
I, I could really use what they have today, you know, the video, the analytics, because I always struggle with my mechanics because I came to pitching so late in my, um, you know, my amateur career. So that was always a, a, a problem for me. Um, but the best thing I always had working is that I'm a very competitive person, uh, whether it's on the field or off the field. And I had a good way about practicing, but once the game started, um, forgetting about all that stuff and just competing. It's you against me, and I'm going to be better than you. And um, I think a lot of times when I watch players today, you know, uh, whether they're hitting or pitching, I think sometimes they get so mechanical, they forget that they're such great athletes and so competitive that uh, more of that probably would uh, be better for them. You know, you mentioned the the tools that pitchers have today, players in general have yeah. today, and I wanted to ask you about that actually because, yeah, I, I could totally see what you mean by using it to benefit you, but you in particular, such a cerebral guy, mm -hmm. uh, Yale, you know, pitcher, do you think that there was a potential if you had so much information mm -hmm. that you could have been someone that maybe got tripped up by it, that you, were, you would try and search too much almost? Well, I was always accused when I played of thinking too much. And I think that's a real fair criticism. I think, uh, you know, at times, um, you know, I'm a perfectionist by nature, so trying to be a perfectionist on the mound mm -hmm. is a good thing, um, but it's, it's not an attainable thing. Mm -hmm. So I was always um, like Don Quixote. I was, uh, you know, searching for something that was unattainable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, it might, it, might, it might have tripped me up, absolutely. Um, but, I, but I think that I would rather have more information mm -hmm. than less. And, and hopefully I would have been able to figure it out. And plus, you know, in my day, if you thought about or tried to talk about it um, in a kind of a cer cerebral way, um, you were kind of laughed at, you know, made fun of. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's certainly not the case today. So it would have been better for me now. You think that there were people on the 86 team that made fun of people? I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that I never, and I'm a voracious reader. I read all the time. I never, ever brought a book in the clubhouse because I was afraid of the ridicule. <laughs> never, ever, in you know, 14 years of playing. What was your reaction to getting traded to the Mets to begin with from Texas as a, as a minor league player who, who got drafted and then shipped off pretty early in your pro career? I, I, was, I was shocked. Um, uh, you know, when you're drafted number one by a team, you just expect that your career is going to be there, like um, that you're loved by this team that really wants to develop you. So. Um, uh, what was amazing to me is that I pitched a lot in spring training for the Rangers in 82. And Don Zimmer, who's the manager, called me in, and they were in Pompano Beach, Florida, which is on the East Coast. And their minor league team was in Plant City, Florida, which is kind of in the center of Florida. Mm -hmm. So he brought me in the office and said, listen, kid, you were great. We're going to send you down to Oklahoma City. You're going to make three starts. And in late April, you're going to make a start in Arlington for us. Mm -hmm. So I got in my uh, uh, Datsun 280Z. Uh, I couldn't drive fast to, to Plant City. I was so excited. And by the time I went from Pompano to Plant City, which is a four-hour drive, yeah. I had been traded. <laughs> so I, I had just been told so, yeah. by the manager that in a month I'm going to be in the, in the big leagues, and I was traded uh, in, the, in that car ride. And I was just um, uh, shocked. And when I got to the hotel, I'll tell you how different the world has changed, uh, no cell phones. Mm -hmm. the, the hotel uh, phone, the light was on, so I knew it was a message. Mm -hmm. And it said it was from Lou Gorman, who was, when I was a schoolboy player, he had been like, you know, a coach or manager or whatever. And so I called him back. I said, hi, hi Mr. Gorman, how are you? He's like, congratulations, Ron, you're a metropolitan. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> like, I honestly didn't know what a metropolitan was. And uh, he explained that I had just been traded for, so it was someone from the Mets that told me first before someone from the Rangers. When you get traded, that team is, is so bad yeah. when you originally get moved to that organization. You were obviously at the front end of that rebuild and that you know, renaissance yeah. for, for this organization. When was the moment where you realized that the team was really trending in a not just a, a positive direction, but kind of an elite direction. Well, when I saw Dwight Gooden in spring training, um, because I knew that, you know, Hernandez was, uh, was money. I knew Strawberry, because I'd played with him, was a, a, just an incredible talent. You know, I, I think, you know, it really rounded into form a couple of years later when we got Carter, of course. But when I saw Dwight Gooden pitch, and he was throwing on the mound, and I was next to him, 
and Sid Fernandez was next to me, and then Rick Aguilera was next to him, and we were all thrown in spring training. I'm sure they've had the feeling here with their, with their young guns. I was like, whoa, uh, we got some really talented people here. And then, then watching Dwight do things, you know, I was always follow Dwight in the rotation, and I'd have to do the chart. In those days, you'd chart the pitches. And, you know, he'd strike out 14, uh, complete game, shut out on like 94 pitches. I mean, it was like the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And, um, and that's, that's when I said, you know, we're, we're going to be good because this, this guy is, he's the best pitcher in the game. Strawberry may be the best right fielder in the game. Hernandez is the best first baseman in the game. I knew we were going to on, on our way. If the playoff format now existed then, you'd have gone to the playoffs seven straight years, 84 <laughs> through 90. You would have made it every single season. Do you, do you look back and, and think, you kind of got robbed in the sense that you only got to win one championship and only go to one World Series? Yeah, I think, uh, it, one, if you look at that kind of stuff or look at like what players are making today, it'll drive you crazy, right? <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I think um, more importantly is that, um, you know, we, we had our chance in our time and we just were playing against really, really good teams. The Cubs had an amazing year in 84, the Cardinals in 85. So I, I don't think I'd, I would change it. I would have loved to have been in the playoffs every, every year and see what we could have done. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't change it, but I, I would change. I think we had a window from 85 to 88 where um, if we had been a little better, I think we should have went to the, you know, at least the World Series. Not win it, but go to the World Series three or four of those years. So instead of being a team that had a great year, mm -hmm. we could have been a great team. And... Um, um, that's, that's the big difference. That one great year, though, is so unique in how it's remembered because mm -hmm. it's remembered for the moments. There were these incredible moments during the playoffs specifically, but it's also remembered for the group of guys, yeah. and that's all that seemingly gets talked about as the years go on. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's anything that gets overlooked about that group that season just based on the the personalities and the few moments that always get talked about? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I, I mean, I think it's fair that uh, uh, people have focused really on, on uh, the camaraderie and the craziness of that team. I think it's very fair. Um, you know, uh, it was before any of the stuff we have now, so you could kind of be in the weeds and do what you wanted to do, and that team had a lot, a lot of fun. What gets lost, I think, it's the only team I've ever played on in 1986. So none of the Mets teams prior, none of the Oakland A's teams after that, and I played with some good Oakland A's teams. Um, that was the only team I've ever played on that not only wanted to win, they wanted to embarrass you. Mm -hmm. And I know that's, that's a really awful thing to even say out loud, and uh, I'm almost ashamed like to say it, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that team would come, and if they could beat you by 10, they'd beat you by 10, if they could beat you by 15. The only way I can equate it is when Tiger Woods was at his best mm -hmm. and he would just want to lap the field. Mm -hmm. That's how that team plays. Is that what makes that team, though, and other championship teams across sports for guys that mm. have never been a professional athlete, is that what makes elite teams elite, that little and added it's, And thing? it's unquantifiable. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. For yeah. a yeah. team to, to go out and get that, yeah. it's not necessarily feasible. It, you know, it's just, it's just you put 25 people in a room and um, there were so many type A personalities that, that um, they were, I mean, we would go out and win a game and get on the bus to travel to the next city and there'd be like a fight on the bus. I mean, it was just so, <laughs> like, so, such silly stuff. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's been many um, or most teams that have won championships have done it maybe in a classier way than we did it. Um, but I, I, I will say, on that team, if you were a fan, when I try to look back on it, you know, you could love Lenny Dykstra or Mookie Wilson because of what he had done for the team. You could like the starting pitching. You could like the two veterans, Carter Hernandez. You could love the two stars, Strawberry Gooden. It was just that there was a lot of different ways to root for that team. So I think that's why fans remember it so much. In the World Series, you pitched Game 7. Everybody knows that. You also pitched Game 4 at Fenway Park. You grew up a Red Sox That's fan. Right. What was, I mean, that would be the first time you pitched there, right? It was the first time that I had pitched there, first time that I had been on the field there. And um, I remember uh, the warm-up was so bad 
because I had people that I'd grown up with were coming down, you know, the bullpens at Fenway mm -hmm. uh, Park or in right field, people coming down and, you know, their strong Boston accents saying, you know, Ronnie <laughs> Dallin, have a good game, you know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I had the worst warm-up ever, uh, bouncing balls. I threw one that bounced off Carter into the other bullpen, which was the Red Sox bullpen. So I remember uh, saying to Mel Slotemeyer, you know, this is just a bad, I don't even want to continue this. I said, let's just get across the field and I'll figure it out once we get on the mound. <laughs> and uh, as I was walking, I mistimed it. So the national anthem was going to play. So I'm stuck in right field with the national anthem about to play. And I hear, pss, 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 and I look over and I'd forgotten that my dad was with the Air National Guard. He was one of the guys holding the flag really? uh, for that game four. And uh, I kind of saddled up next to him, and he had taught me the game. And um, as soon as the national anthem was done, and, and you just never know what kind of moments are going to happen in your life, I was like, I got this. I've been doing this my whole life. Mm -hmm. And uh, seven shutout innings later, uh, it came true. Steve, we did it. We, we got, got something, something new. new. <laughs> we, did it. we should just wrap up the interview now. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, game six. That's been talked about. Let's try another one, okay? Oh, okay. That's been talked okay. about from so many different angles, and it seems like that same story has been told over and over and over mm -hmm. again. But the thing that I'm curious about is, as someone who is in that moment, mm. when does it really hit you just what happened? Like, it seems to me that the immediacy of it, you can't grasp just how crazy a comeback that is. Yeah, it was. you have to put it in perspective because... When they came back, the light bulb had to go on for me because I was pitching game seven, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so from my perspective, it's a little different. Here's the second thing that no one knows. So uh, in game six, after the ninth inning is tied, Rick Aguilera is going to take the mound. Mel Stottlemyre comes up to me on the bench. He says, listen, I want you to go home. We're going to win this game, and I want you to be ready for game seven. I said, you sure? He said, yeah. Um, why? Well, there were 55, 56,000 people in the stands. And after the home games, you literally had to wait two hours before you could even shower. Mm. And then you'd shower maybe two and a half hours before you could head back to the city. So he was trying to, you know, to save me from that. So I didn't even shower, threw on my clothes, got in my car, got on the Grand Central Parkway, and I'm driving. Got Murphy on the radio. And as I'm driving, you know, um, you hear um, Dave Henderson, you know, called by Bob Murphy, just went deep. So you turned it around because, you know, win or lose, you want to be with your mates. And, and if we lost, I wanted to make sure I was in the clubhouse. So I get in the clubhouse. It had two entrances. One was to the field and one was from, uh, one was from like the front uh, of, this, of the stadium. So I come in one door just about the same time that Keith is coming in the other door because Keith had made the second out. Mm -hmm. And a little salty language later, he's in and I can hear him. <laughs> So I go into uh, uh, our um, clubhouse guy, Charlie Samuel's office, and I sit, I'm looking at the TV, and I go, what's going on, Charlie? He said, there's two outs. Max just flew out to center field. So I still hear more salty language from Keith, but he's in Davey's office. So he's in Davey's office. I'm in Charlie Samuel's office. Charlie Samuel's has like a, like a, a six by six TV. I'm watching, I can barely <laughs> see it. And, uh, and there's two outs and then Carter gets to hit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you guys have been around ball players enough. You know, anything that happens good, you do not move. You right. just stay in your spot. And I stayed in my spot the entire time. Of course, the great comeback. And then when the guys came running in, I just remember like the hair on my neck um, just starting to grow because I was like, okay, this is really great, but you know, within 24 hours, I'm gonna take the mound mm -hmm. for a game seven which, to, you know, is every kid's dream is to, you know, if you're a baseball pitcher, pitching game seven. If you're a golfer, it's putting for the U.S. Open. Um, so as everyone was so excited and hugging, and, and I was like, whoa, this is like <laughs> very nervous right now. And, um, and uh, uh, it, it, it honestly never, ever left me. Um, and I was nervous all the way up to the next night, and then the game got called because of rain. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I kind of uh, relaxed. But I was nervous from the second that uh, Ray Knight scored mm -hmm. to the second before they called it because of rain. How has your relationship with Keith changed from being player teammates to broadcast teammates? Um, yeah, it's, um, you know, when you play in a championship team, you're brothers for life mm -hmm. kind of deal. 
But I think like, I feel like Keith is that older brother that I never had, you know, like he, um, and I didn't feel like that as a player, mm -hmm. you know, Keith and I were, I remember in his book, I was so angry at him. He wrote in his book that I was aloof. And then, you know, I lived my life and I figured out I am pretty aloof. <laughs> and, um, but he, he was spot on. And, and I remember I was angry about it when it came out. And so we were close, but I would say that we weren't as close. And I think we became closer as players because our two girlfriends were friends. Mm -hmm. So that made us a little closer. But we were never like in the off season, hey, let's go fishing or mm -hmm. something. And what has happened now in the booth is that, you know, you just, and you guys know this, you know, you get in that booth and you're doing games, there's a trust factor that develops between broadcasters where, you know, you, you're there to take care of each other mm -hmm. because it's not all going to be rosy. Some, sometimes it's going to be really a uh, bumpy road and, and you, you need to lean on each other. And so just as I did as a player mm -hmm. and when he was the captain of the team, I, I, I do that now in the broadcast booth, but I feel more like his equal. Because mm -hmm. when I played, I did not feel like his equal right. because he was such a great, great player. He's the greatest player I ever played with. Um, so I wasn't as, and maybe, that's the, the, maybe that was the difficulty, difficulty of the relationship is because you know, he was older, he was so much better, and I looked up to him, but I couldn't be an equal with him. Now I feel like an equal. Did you feel that way as soon as you guys were put together in the booth, or did you even have to overcome that on that level? That's an interesting question. I, I, never, I never felt as though um, that we had to de develop a kind of um, you know, pecking order on how we did things because Gary was coming from radio, mm -hmm. so this is the first time for TV. Keith had the most experience of anyone on TV, and, and I had one year, yep. one year. So um, no, I, I think that uh, we were just scared to death about how many mistakes we were going to make. So we just kind of leaned on each other and we became equal straight away. Why did you get into broadcasting? It was, what, 10 years after you were done playing? Why did you want to get back into baseball? Well, I always say this, is that after you stop playing, there's a reason you stop playing. For 99% of the players, it's because you stink. And uh, they kind of let you go. And um, I think for most ball players, as soon as you're let go, it kind of breaks your heart. And for five years, I would say most ball players don't watch games. They might catch a World Series game or whatever, but it's almost like the game betrayed you, mm -hmm. but it didn't. You know, it's just you ran out of time. You know, you, you only have so many pitches, so many at-bats, whatever. So once you get over that, the five-year period, I call it, then you start to realize, oh, I really like baseball. Yeah. I mean, I've always loved baseball. <laughs> and then um, most players look to get back in, whether they're coaching or, or, or broadcasting or whatever. And I was asked by a friend, to come to Los Angeles from San Francisco, spend a summer, and do a baseball kind of pregame show. Mm -hmm. I said, LA, summer, sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. And I went down there, and I just, um, I really love the process of, of, you know, broadcasting seems like it's um, highfalutin, yeah. but it's really a blue collar kind of job, <laughs> right? I mean, you show up, yeah. you work your rear end off, and then you go home, kind of, I mean, we just have the graveyard shift. You know, that's right. the, the only mm -hmm. difference. And, and uh, I come from a long line of blue-collar people, so maybe this is the perfect job for me. How do you, oh, you can go ahead. You can Thank go you ahead, Wayne. No, go. <laughs> the favorite thing you've ever said to me as a broadcaster yeah. in the few games we've done together is that we are the stewards of that particular game. I, I love the way you phrase that because you're in charge up there of presenting that game mm. on that day, and, and having that focus day in and day out, I think, is what makes you guys great every single night mm. in, in your TV booth. I, I think that uh, maybe the focus, um, I think sometimes the lack of focus uh, <laughs> in, in our booth uh, can work for us because I think we're honest about mm -hmm. it. Like, uh, I mean, I don't think there's anyone else on TV other than Keith that can say, uh, Gary asked him a question. So, what was that, Gary? I wasn't listening. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I don't think there's anyone else who can do that. So, um, but but you're right. Uh, stewards and and I think that you know when I think of when I think of play-by-play -play people, Gary, yourself, um, you're really a caretaker of the of of the game. Not only that game, the history of the game, um, and I think that's uh, the guys that are really good at it um, take care of it better than others. How do you think you've evolved as a broadcaster? Mm. When you started, you had no basis in it, and you've grown to not just be a part of this 
incredibly revered booth, but one of the national voices of the sport. Uh, I get asked all the time, and you guys probably do too, how do you get into TV? And um, I, I think there's two things you can control. Um, maybe not control completely, but you can work incredibly hard and make sure you know your stuff, okay? Second, you have to get the reps. You just have to at some point. And if that means, like Gary Cohen being in Durham or wherever it is, you have to get the reps. Because the more reps you get and the more knowledge you bring, then you, your inner you, comes shining through. Mm -hmm. The last part is the tough part. Because the inner you is then the subjective part because then the fans let you know if they like you or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really can't control that. You know, I think you just have to, if you become what you are inside and bring that to the booth, then when the proverbial you know what hits the fan, yeah. um, you will be right because you'll be passionate and you'll um, know what you're talking about because you, you put all this uh, work into it. Um, but then after that, you have to like let it go. And I think in today's world, where there's so much, it's really easy to criticize, right? Uh, announcers or whatever. Um, I've tell, told announcers that I've worked in this game for 50 years that after a game, especially a postseason game, uh, I'll see them on their phone and they're looking at it to make sure, you know. And I, I said, please, what you need to do is put your phone down. We're going to go to the hotel. We're going to have a nice bourbon. And then you can do whatever you want to do after that. <laughs> but I think it's important, like after the game, to really. Just let it go, because if you're prepared and you work at it, then that's all you can do. You want to get some fan uh, questions? We're on the same oh, page fan, here. Nice. Right? So we'll do fan questions, and then we have one tradition that we end every okay. podcast right. with. Okay. Um, Steve Calicos, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Steve. Yeah, well, you got to go. Best, best name there. Um, <laughs> which modern-day pitcher would you compare yourself to? Wow. I think that um, it's an easy one for me because I get to watch them all the time. But... If Jacob deGrom is a 10, which I, I think he is on a scale of 1 to 10, I was Jacob deGrom light at about a 7.5. And, a half. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, because I think we were, we were very similar. You know, he was a, uh, a shortstop, I was a shortstop, became a pitcher. Um, he's, you know, uber competitive. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, on a, on a lesser scale, I mean, the great thing about Jacob is I, as I watch him pitch is that, you know, the Mets have this hierarchy of pitchers, you know, it's Seaver and Gooden and Kuzman and, and others, all right? And I'm probably a part of that group. But every start he makes pushes me behind him yeah. because that's how good he is. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know what? I'm so fine with that because he's so good. There's a question here from G. Baez, a past listener evidently. He yeah. said that Ed Lynch <laughs> talked about working with Gary Carter. How was your experience with Gary as a catcher? We butted heads uh, initially. Um, when Gary came over, he was very um, opinionated, mm -hmm. and um, he was uh, very stubborn. And when he would call a game, it was either his way or the highway. And um, I don't know. I, 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 have, I have trouble with authority, I guess. So um, he would do things like, you know, when they put one down for a fastball and you shake it off, mm -hmm he would put one down again, and you'd shake it off. He would put his glove in front of his face. <laughs> so you'd be looking at him, and it's like, he's not going to give me another sign. <laughs> and so you'd have to throw a fastball. So we, we butted heads initially, and then our relationship grew into something that was really, you know, for lack of a better word, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because once I trusted him, and we didn't have computers, we didn't have you know, tendencies or any of that kind of stuff. He was our computer because he knew the entire National League. But once I trusted him and once he trusted me, um, it, it became a really beautiful relationship. And I, I have only one picture in my house from my playing days. And it's myself and Gary after a complete game against the Phillies in 88 where we won the National League East. And it's just a handshake, my arm around his shoulder, and because I remember exactly how that felt. It was like, you know, this was great. We did a great job tonight. And that's the, you know, that's what's great about, you know, that, that kind of relationship with pitcher catcher. Because at, at times it can be so beautifully intimate because 
it's almost like you're reading each other's mind. Well, before we get to our, our Jay story, get it, get it ready. <laughs> uh, what was the toughest thing you dealt with as a player? Um, I, I think, uh, I think the, the, the most difficult thing is, is the failing part. Um, I, I think that um, we, most athletes, most baseball players, come from a place where they were the best player in their hamlet, the town, their city. Um, they have just crazy success throughout their entire life. And then yet 22 years old, you're thrown into this game where um, if you have two good starts and one bad one, it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's days that you go out there and you feel like you have no control because, um, because the players are so good. And it wasn't until Mel Stoudemire said a very simple sentence to me. I'll never forget it, as long as I live. I had two or three bad starts in a row, and you know we were out, we're gonna throw on the side, and, and he just put his arm around me and he says, hey, listen, don't be so hard on yourself. I said, Mel, you know, that's three bad starts. Anything you're seeing? He goes, no, you, you look fine. He goes, remember, the other team's trying. <laughs> I think that was the greatest line ever, because that, that allowed me to kind of, that's right, I'm playing against the best players in the game. If you're not up to it, it's not because you're always so bad. Sometimes it's because they're so good. All right. It's time. It's time. Favorite Jay Horowitz story. That, you know, <laughs> that's arable here. My, oh, wow. Yeah. My, my favorite Jay Horowitz story, and I've got a thousand of them, um, is how nervous he was in Houston, Texas, when he had to come and bail four guys out of jail. <laughs> and to see his face, because Jay is, is a little nervous anyways. Um, for the folks out there who don't know, uh, there was a kind of a bar fight at this place called Cooters. Four of us, uh, Tuffle, Ojeda, myself, and Aguilera, ended up in the clink. And, um, I'll and never <laughs> understand how Tuffle was a part uh, of that, yeah, by the way. He's the one who started it, <laughs> yeah, by the way. No, the worst, uh, he was the worst <laughs> defender. But, um, but seeing Jay and how fidgety he is, waiting for us as we walked out of the jail and into his arms, like, Jay, Jay, <laughs> so happy. Um, I think that's probably a, a, a story that, um, that I'll, I'll always remember. Ron, this was, this was so awesome. I, I, we really appreciate you doing this and spending so much great. time with us. You guys are the best. Thank you, Ron. Thank, Thank you, man. Fun. Thank you.